And now it's time to kick off our uh, this afternoon uh, sessions. Um, and we will be talking about building smart cities in the Gulf region that lead way for sustainable future. We will take a closer look to the transformative power of smart city initiatives in the Gulf region where innova when innovation and sustainability converge to shape a brighter tomorrow. Without further ado, I will invite our moderator, Madeleine Aubert, uh, Aubert et je bien prononce aussi, uh, Sec uh, Secretary General of AFEX, uh, architect français à l'export. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we start this afternoon just after lunch. It's a difficult hour. So I hope you are awake and you will enjoy uh, what we shall talk about. This is the smart city. We have four panelists with us uh, to, to express themselves about what they do uh, in their field, each one in their field, uh, in smart cities section, let's say. Okay, so we'll start with Imkan Property, Muhammad Jawad. Then uh, Mazdar City will be represented by uh, Mohamed al -Breiki. And uh, Aztec International by Diana Pankova. And Shofa Holding, Monaster Kalarshi. Okay, so I shall ask them a few questions. We have very short time, so I ask them to be, you know, brief and uh, matter, of, matter of fact, okay? So Imkan Property, Muhammad, could you summarize uh, your activities in the Gulf region, please? Uh, thank you, Madeline. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, uh, Imkan Properties, just a little bit about Imkan Properties. Uh, we are a real estate developer, uh, as well as manager of our assets in Abu Dhabi, which is the capital of United Arab Emirates. Uh, we have our projects in five different countries um, across the globe, and uh, we take pride ourselves uh, in place, uh, as a placemakers. Uh, we call said that we are placemakers with human guided by the human experiences. And we endeavor to create uh, soulful places with enriched lives. So this is where our main theme line is. Going beyond uh, what Imkan does is, as I mentioned, that we, we develop our assets. And our develop, uh, this, the development of our assets is based on the three key strategies and the principles that we follow. Uh, one of the main principles is that we have a research-based, uh, you know, following ship in terms of when we create the develop uh, our projects. Second, what we do as Imkan is that through innovation and the future-looking approach, where we ensure that uh, the dynamics of real estate, which is continually changing, and we make sure that we apply to that innovation and create those kind of properties that meets the needs of the human-centric uh, human approach. And that last but not least, we believe that uh, it is uh, beyond the, uh, having the innovation connectivity technology, it is also extremely important that having a social and cultural um, you know, um, connectivity within your project to make it human-centric. This is how the Imkan approach towards the projects, uh, developing a project from start till its management. All right, uh, you said general things, and I think I hope everybody understands what you do really. I want, I'd like you to be uh, very uh, positive to tell us what are your main actions to make cities sustainable. Well, uh, the main action that we take when it comes to developing the project uh, at the development is the des design stage, right? So at the design stage, as I said, that we do a research based approach. Uh, and we understand the kind of a concept that our customers need. Based on that customer need, we create that design and develop the project. You know, me, uh, myself being from the area of expertise when it comes to the property management, that area where we endeavor that as a property that we manage, we create those kind of sustainable approach and initiatives that makes the life of our living, the living and working experience mm -hmm. manageable and sustainable. And these are the approach I always take as a property management side of it to work towards this direction. And uh, can you give us some example of uh, your actions? Right, absolutely. See, so this, this, when we talk about the, the, the area of expertise, we're talking about the property management, it's, it's, it's not always about the traditional activities of the property management. And now we have gone beyond to that, right? So when I'm, the, the action we have taken is that there are four key principles 
uh, that has come in the management of smart cities that we continue to follow is on the data utilization and the management. We talk about the waste management and the utility uh, efficiency, uh, energy efficiency. The other third aspect of it, we talk about the experience of our tenants. And last but not least is the security and the privacy. So all these four elements, we work on example on all these areas one by one to ensure that whatever the actions we take, we follow them and we apply them in the properties that we manage and ultimately that brings the result in the assets management and of course increase the value of the assets. I understand. Uh, you said uh, your action was human-centered. Can you focus on that? Well, see, the human-centric is understanding the behavior of the customers, right? So it's when you develop a residential project or when, you, when we are manage a residential project or an office uh, property or a retail property, right? So by understanding the human experiences, what exactly their needs are, uh, what, they, what are the amenities that uh, you know, they want to have it, what kind of uh, technology they need it to, you know, to, uh, to make their life easy in an office environment or a retail environment or a residential environment. By having that kind of understanding of the approach, so you build based on that. And you create those kind of applications, the digitization that makes their life easy. So having that kind of approach, this is where we always ensure that our you know, customers get the needs of what they need. Okay, thank you very much. Now we shall uh, start with uh, Mazdar City. Uh, all right. Can you present Mazda City rapidly, please? Uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here with you this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Mazda City, for those uh, who don't know a lot about Mazda City, it's located in the United Arab Emirates, the, uh, Abu Dhabi, the capital of the United Arab Emirates, strategically located next to the uh, Abu Dhabi International Airport. Uh, ever since we started, since inception, we've been at the forefront of sustainable development in the, in the region. Uh, Mazdar today is one of the uh, most sustainable cities in the world. Uh, it is uh, a low uh, carbon mixed development uh, made up of uh, a clean tech uh, cluster, uh, a business uh, free zone, uh, residential uh, neighborhood and grade A uh, office spaces, as well as uh, award winning uh, open public uh, recreation facilities. Uh, how, do you, how, how do you make it sustainable, please? Absolutely. Well, through, through what? First and foremost, uh, all our buildings in Mazdar City have been designed in accordance with the most robust uh, local and uh, global sustainability standards. Uh, we are heavily focused on uh, sustainable development through the reduction of uh, demand in energy and water, uh, as well as reusing and recycling waste material. And according to you, what are Mazda City major improvements regarding the overall vision of a sustainable city? You even said you were at the forefront of sustainable city. That's Tell right. Tell us about it. Mazda City uses uh, clean energy uh, generated on site uh, through the uh, 10 megawatt uh, solar, uh, solar power plant that we established uh, back in 2019 and was the biggest of its kind back then. Uh, it also uses the uh, 10, uh, the, uh, the two megawatt BV panels mounted on the roof of the, of the buildings. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, we've pioneered uh, autonomous vehicles in the city. Uh, we've pioneered two generations of autonomous vehicles. We started back in 2009 when we operated the first of its kind in the region. Uh, the uh, personal rapid transit, uh, fully electrical, fully driverless. Uh, we've recently partnered with a French company called Navia. Uh, and we've deployed uh, an autonomous car, uh, an autonomous vehicle that can take up to uh, 12 uh, passengers at one time uh, and has been in operation since 2019. So these are a few examples and looking into the future, uh, we are reaffirming our commitment to sustainability and innovation uh, with, the, uh, with the groundbreaking of our recent developments. Uh, so uh, we've recently brought ground on three unique projects, uh, MC Square, Mazar City Square, the link and M13B. Uh, these three projects uh, are quite different in, in, in terms of scale and ultimate use. However, they share one thing in common, which is quite amazing. Uh, they, are all, they are all net zero energy buildings, meaning that they will, uh, they will use no more than the power generated on site through uh, renewable and clean energy sources. I'm very sorry you cannot see uh, what we are talking about. It would be much easier if you have an image of presenting uh, what everybody is here doing, but still you can imagine it, I hope. And uh, I have another question for you in Mazdar City. Do you think this example can be reproduced? 
Absolutely. I mean, this is the whole mission, uh, and, and the, the main aim uh, is to create a model, a template, uh, the, for an, an a green print for the whole world to follow. And uh, the, the, the template is readily available uh, for any replication across the, the globe. All right, let's go to your neighbor. So, Diana from Aztec International. So, what is Aztec International, please? First of all, thank you for having me. I greet all the beautiful audiences here. Thank you for everyone to, for traveling to France. I know it can be challenging, as well as taking a flying taxi, <laughs> since we're talking about the smart cities over here. So Aztec International and Aztec Middle East is a company that helps the concepts like smart cities that sound really innovative, really futuristic, something that is possible. And I know it sounds technological and it's really important, every aspect of what's been mentioned over here, but these projects, these mega concepts really are facing issues, and I think uh, you will agree with me, uh, that are very, very much human because where there is value, economical value, there's always risk. And a part of that risk is the fact that there is reliance on human resource involved. And basically, this is a, uh, an issue and a challenge that Aztec is there to resolve. So what we do is we bring in agility, we bring in flexibility, payment terms and appreciation of uh, local culture, and we deal with it. And uh, this is why Aztec is famous for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, releasing a lot of governmental projects and GCC projects in Saudi Arabia and UAE that involves a lot of complicated technology, uh, like, for example, a healthcare IoT platform that involves real-time analysis of data points uh, and monitoring of health of patients and also uh, monitoring of uh, real-time traffic and real-time decisions made uh, based on the ML algorithms in uh, UAE and many other uh, governmental and semi-governmental projects. So it's really technological, as I've mentioned, but it's not. It is human. So uh, we do need to address those risks and resolve them and uh, uh, resolve issues like compliance, like regulations, and cut costs, because these are long-term projects, and we need to make sure that these projects don't get shut down because this is going to stop progress. I understand. Thank you very much. And uh, how smart infrastructure and digital technology contribute to the development of, of smart cities, in your opinion? Can you please repeat the question? How I said, how smart infrastructure and digital technology contribute to the development of smart cities? What is the role of technology oh. in smart cities? Because it's a, a, real, a real question. Yeah, smart infrastructure is, of course, uh, contributing to the uh, factors of uh, our comfort in our everyday lives. And uh, it seems to be a very on the surface uh, factor in it. But we also need to be looking at it uh, from a bigger perspective. Uh, the capitalization of the market is 25.5 uh, trillion uh, dollars. Uh, that's expected to grow to this point uh, by 2025. And uh, uh, the comfortability of our lives uh, is actually the factor that's going to attribute uh, investors and new businesses, and that's the part of the innovation uh, model, uh, business model trend. Okay. So it's one of the contributing factors of the economy uh, growing. Thank you very much. So now, Surfa Holding, so what are your missions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Shurfa Holding, just I'll start with a very quick introduction about Shurfa Holding. Shurfa Holding basically is a conglomerate uh, started uh, from a uh, historical family legacy back in 1944. So it was starting with the residential uh, development uh, of uh, residential business units. Uh, then uh, it went into major diversification program. So today we're having around 43 different uh, investment companies. 
Uh, basically around strategic uh, verticals. Uh, of course, the real estate development remains the backbone, but we have heavily in the industry uh, vertical, which is basically, again, on the uh, recycling industry, sustainability industries. Um, and then we have, of course, the uh, education uh, vertical. We have uh, the uh, financial services verticals and the innovation and technology vertical including uh, the uh, platforms for artificial intelligence development of applications, including the platforms of uh, incubating startups. And uh, this is basically where we're, uh, we're moving. So we're growing through partnership. Uh, we're growing uh, in our strategic verticals by uh, getting vertically integrated and delivering more. And uh, what we're trying to do is trying to synergize the capabilities that we're having uh, especially when it comes to the technology and the innovation platform into all the different sectors that we're having to come up with the smart product and smart solutions and being participative in that wave of technologies that is moving on. Thank you very much. And uh, according to you, uh, the private sector has it a role to play in favor of the development of smart cities? And if it has, what is it? Uh, very interesting question. Thank you very much. Uh, smart city is actually, everybody's talking about smart city, but everyone talks from his own perspective. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, smart cities uh, has been taking many definitions in the past, but in my opinion, uh, it goes beyond connecting infrastructures. It goes beyond connecting smart devices. So basically, what is the mission of why we're having smart cities? We want to do smart cities because we want to improve the quality of the decision making and how we do that by basically uh, giving or enabling the uh, accessibility of data to the end user so that when they want to make decisions, they make an informative decision. Uh, they uh, know what are the comparatives in front of them when they make a decision. And all of that can be done through the applications. Now, a lot of countries have done in developing, went into improving and upgrading their infrastructures. Take, for example, Saudi Arabia in terms of uh, Vision 2030. There has been a massive rollout, for example, of smart electrical devices, energy devices. More than 10 million devices have been rolled out and installed in, uh, in less than two years. Uh, smart metering devices, the infrastructures, the 5G network, uh, the uh, enablement of the narrowband IoT. So in terms of infrastructure, you have everything in place. Then what? Then it's really up to the private sector to come and saying, I want to be a participative. Really, the role of the government, the role of the utilities, is moving to become a solution enabler. And really, the private sector should be the solution participative in a collaborative manner. And that's where we believe that why we have a technology hub, why we have a technology platform, why we have an, an uh, uh, um, artificial intelligence platform through our investment subsidiaries in Ahoy and so on, because we believe that we have a role to play in the smart cities of the future. We have the enablement that is done by the government. We have the enablement that is done by Vision 2030. Thriving economy is definitely one of the key focus of Vision 2030. And if we go down uh, from, uh, from that to, to really um, fulfilling that, uh, that vision, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically taking that thriving economy to enable businesses to grow and develop new applications. And that's what we believe our mission is. Thank you. And can you give us an example of a successful public-private partnership in this field? Uh, OK, I have many examples. But uh, for the sake of time, I will just uh, mention one or two things that we're, uh, that we're working on in Shurfa. Uh, for example, uh, we, we've been always talking about uh, saving nature. Uh, doing more with less, uh, especially when it comes to water. I mean, in, uh, in, the, in a place like Saudi Arabia or the Gulf, where water is, uh, is really uh, uh, a very uh, scared kind of material. So uh, we know that, for example, the National Water Company have rolled out meters, smart meters, and all over the implementation. Then we thought, okay, we are a developer. We, are, we do residential uh, business units. Today, we are having almost 500 units offered for, for sale. Next year, we have another 800 units, and so on. So what we, what we did, we came up through our, again, um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, industry 4.0 platform uh, to develop a sub-metering application. 
what, again, I don't want to be technical. I'm sorry, I don't want to, I know it's after lunch. I know you're all sleepy, but please <laughs> bear with me. And I promise I won't go technical. But when we're talking about submetering, basically, when you are when you're sitting in, a, in a, a residential unit and you have an app on your computer, uh, basically telling you, listen, uh, you're living in 140 square meters uh, apartment. Normally, the consumption of this should be that much of cubic meter. By the way, this is only uh, half of the month, and you have already consumed more than a normal human being would consume. Be careful. Or maybe you have a leakage. Because if you look at the trends of the last year, this month, they have something wrong. You have been over-consuming of water. And all of that is done through smart artificial platform that we're trying to develop in our, in our applications. So yes, I'm participating. I'm delivering a smart solution. I'm part of the smart city. I'm creating that kind of profiling. And what I'm doing at the end, actually I'm influencing the human, the consumer behavior. Because yes, we want to conserve energy. We don't want to spend much. Mazdar is uh, doing uh, nice stuff in conserving energy. Uh, National Water Company is doing that much in conserving water. Then, uh, what do you do, Mr. Individual? Oh, I don't have enough data. I, I don't know how to manage it. Well, I'm, I'm, as a private sector, I'm giving you that enablement. You can measure, you can read, you can, you can see that you are taking more what it should be. You know that spending more money, you can, you can link it to tariff, you can link it to consumption, you can link it to comparables of a normal uh, spending. And it gives you alarm also if you have a leakage in your house or you have a problem. I mean, that's one example on the water. I have so many things that we're, we're doing, but uh, again, I don't want to take the time of everybody else. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Okay, so now everybody has presented their activities. You know more about them, even if you don't understand everything, I'm sure. But you, you can meet them afterwards if you want to, to know more about each of them. But we have going to have a small talk about... Uh, our conceptions in general about a smart city. I have prepared two questions. Uh, I, I shall come back to, to what I prepared, I think. Has the sustainable city, according to you all, uh, an economic value? Has smart city an economic value? Is it a business model now, to a certain extent? And can tomorrow project be unsustainable? Who would like to, to, to answer that? Uh, the, the, the short answer is definitely yes. Uh, the, <laughs> must, must, it's must, enough, okay, must, thank must, you. <laughs> <laughs> Mazdar City is just another prime example uh, yeah. where we have uh, managed to uh, develop a template that is uh, commercially viable, uh, improves on the quality of life with the very minimal uh, environmental impact ever. Uh, the, uh, um, uh, it's quite unfortunate that there's, there's a misconception amongst uh, many of us that uh, sustainability and profitability are two conflicting goals. Uh, they're absolutely not. Uh, a very, uh, an evident to what I'm saying is the fact that uh, our spaces, uh, they're fully occupied. Uh, and you mean it sells well? It sells very well. Uh, tenants, customers, clients are very, very well informed. Uh, very are they happy? They're extremely happy, according to the recent surveys that we push out on, every, on a regular basis. Uh, and the, the, the response that we get uh, is quite phenomenal. Okay. Please. I'm not going to give a short, a very short answer, but I totally agree. There are examples uh, where we see that it is successful. We also do examples where it's not. Does it mean that it doesn't have value? Absolutely not. It does have value. And as I've mentioned, we're expecting to, this market to grow until $25 trillion by 2025. That does mean something. But where is ma where, where, uh, when there is value, there is a lot of risk involved. That's economical risk. There's financial risk, there's technological risk, and there are many other risks that are being involved. And our uh, duty is to manage that risk well. And we can help with that, and we have to do that. I mean, there are examples. For example, there is uh, King Abdullah Economic City, and we've expected uh, this city to have uh, 2 million people uh, living there, and. Uh, I think Mohammed uh, has visited. Uh, he shared that with me right before the meeting. And uh, there are people there. 
and it is a great place to live, but somehow something went wrong. And I think what went wrong there is that it wasn't uh, human-centered enough. It wasn't citizen-centered enough. And this is the problem that we need to pay attention to more. And uh, this is another point that I'm getting uh, towards to. I think that uh, smart city industry is facing new challenges and new risks, and uh, we need to make sure that we are adapting fast enough because this long-term approach uh, makes us maybe not uh, reactive uh, enough, and that makes us lose a lot of money and resources, and it also affects people's lives in a very long-term perspective, and it's very important to manage well. So let's not do it because we're facing more projects in Saudi Arabia and in Dubai. And uh, again, we can provide the best talent possible in order to avoid those mistakes that were committed in the past. I have another, qu oh, please go ahead. But still, I have another question right now. But we, we can come, you can come back to the economic aspect. So are smart speed cities uh, human friendly? Uh, the short answer is, of course, definitely again, going back to yes. Uh, but uh, going before that, uh, talking about the benefits of smart cities, and we talk about human-centric, people-centric, and all that. Let me give you some um, key data figures. There is a report from McKinsey Global 2018. And uh, they talk about the, they did not consider the non-technological uh, advantages, only the smart technology advantages. If they are embedded in a smart city. So what will happen? We can save up to 300 lives in a year in a city of 5 million. Approximately 80 liter of water per person per day can be saved. We talk about 15 to 30 minutes of commute time can be reduced. We talk about approximately 25% approximately the average response time to the emergencies will be reduced, and eight to ten percent it will be low burden of disease. Now that's enough to say that it's going to definitely be advantageous for everyone. So from uh, from my perspective, when I manage those properties, I look at those things, and I'm glad that being a property management uh, a professional, we are part of the conversation because while the developers build those smart cities, it's important that we as the property management departments are there to manage them as well. If we are not aligned what's happening around, then the people who are gonna live and work in those cities won't get the experience what, what you envisioned to begin with. So it's extremely important that and these are the, all the advantages, and of course... That the final user understands your, your intentions. I'm sorry, come again? That the final user understands your intentions. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think it's all, uh, it's all well said. Again, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, when we're coming to influencing the better quality of life, uh, is basically you're doing all of that enablement and giving the right data to the decision maker to take the right decisions. So it's rationally informed decisions backed by data. And uh, rationally, the human being will go and make the best decision. And that will impact the quality of life, that impact also the utilization of resources that we're having around us. And uh, I think that's the whole essence of having smart city. Thank you. You, know, you all know that uh, I, I'm involved in a, an association of French architects working overseas. And uh, we all think, of course, then, uh, that the importance for projects is to in invest in intelligence. And that's exactly what we heard. And uh, we, we, we think it about the city, you know, it, it, the city has to be thought over very thoroughly before you start. And Mazda City is not going to say the contrary of that. And uh, my association is, name is uh, French Architects Overseas, AFEX, Architect Francais à l'Export, which means we work internationally. And I have a question for all of you that, you know, I'm, I'm interested really in your answers. Does GCC intend to provide the world with models of sustainable city? 
<laughs> I would like to say something. There is a quote, a very beautiful quote that I think is a beautiful introduction to what I have to say on the subject. Um, unfortunately, I don't remember who said that, but it totally makes sense. It goes, most cities don't control technology. Most technologies shape the cities and they turn into completely uncreative and repetitive systems. And I think this is the pattern that is very important to avoid when it comes to using a template globally. See, Gulf is a very, very unique region, culturally, and especially when it comes to the environmental specifics, like a climate, like a lake of water that's already been mentioned. So when you think about the Middle Eastern city at a very, very old Middle Eastern city, the traditional one, the containment of resources is laying in the foundation of its infrastructure. So I think it's completely not a coincidence that, the, that we're having this discussion today because did really people in the Middle East have a choice but to be very, very conscious about how they're using their resources. So I think it's very important for us to make sure that when we use this model, that's of course very, very important to provide to other countries and to interpret correctly and accordingly to the uh, challenges that are being solved in different regions because Thank repetitiveness you. is going to be... Uh, this is the basic vital. analysis, I think, of every th one thinking about making a city, especially a new city. Yeah. Calibration is key. Uh, partnership between uh, public, pu the public sector, the private sector, uh, is essential for us to uh, support uh, the smart city objectives and make sure that uh, we, uh, we move ahead with the decarbonization uh, efforts. Uh, and I think it won't be possible uh, for, uh, for for one, one nation uh, to go so far alone. Uh, the the cross collaboration between um, uh, the the partners uh, is, is is important, uh, and then we can uh, definitely uh, uh, learn new lessons, uh, share some knowledge, and exchange views as well. Uh, now, uh, cities of the future have to be smart. The need for sustainable. Uh, smart cities uh, has never been greater, uh, given, given the urbanization that is happening uh, at a scary rate, uh, the population growth, uh, they're all causing th some serious threat to the climate change, uh, as well as the uh, world uh, natural resources, and we live in this world together. Uh, so the, uh, the collaboration amongst uh, the key players in the industry is, is, is important. However, though, it needs to be designed uh, to meet the needs of the residents. And believe it or not, not every problem has a technological solution to it. But, yeah, uh, but sometimes human solutions. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, thank you, Madeleine. I think the, um, the question you have raised now can take the discussion really to a total different level. Uh, we started the discussion about the, about the smart cities and the applications, the engagements, how we can contribute, how we can capitalize on what is being done in terms of infrastructure and so on. And now, you, you made the fast forward shift to sustainability. Um, that's a big topic again. I mean, uh, thank you for that. But really when, uh, when you're discussing about the enablement of sustainability in the um, GCC countries, I'm talking about KC in particular, where uh, I'm more uh, familiar with because all my life has been there. Uh, sustainability topic really opens a window of opportunities that goes beyond imagination. Um, beyond the smart city applications, what we're, what we're talking about. Here we're talking about the recycling, we're talking about the reuse, we're talking about the refining of final products. Uh, we're the, we're the, the, talking about dealing with waste, you know how much is developed uh, the uh, industrial platform, especially in oil and gas, petrochemicals, all the hydrocarbon and cycle in Saudi Arabia. So taking all of that industrial waste, uh, refining it, going out away from the historical refilling way to actual treatment uh, and, and processing of all of the uh, residuals that comes out from the petrochemical industries or the oil and gas industry. I would say simply if you're saying that, uh, again, everybody was answering simply yes, yes. 
The answer is yes. <laughs> How, for example, if you take Saudi Arabia today, they have created an entity uh, uh, called Mawan, uh, which is basically a regulator to regulate only the waste and the recycling of industry. And uh, this regulator is coming uh, now into a stream, of course. We'll, uh, we'll hear more about it, and probably next year we'll have a session about recycling industry in, uh, in particular. Uh, but uh, if you look at uh, uh, the work they've been de dealing today in segmenting the type of wastes in the, in the market, how we want to deal with each one of them, what kind of incentives that, uh, from a regulatory point of view, we need to put in order to motivate, and, and private sector comes in, how many industries potential you unleash with this kind of regulation that you put in place. So if that's only if you take one particular part. If you jump to another part, part which is, for example, the, the greenhouses, we're, we're talking about real estate, the protect, and so on. Uh, today we're, we're working on a, on a very ambitious program with uh, uh, our partners uh, here in uh, Hoffman Green Cement Technologies to set up uh, a green cement uh, plants for plants in Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, that's a total paradigm shift. That's a total disruptive of everything we knew about industry. Uh, now we're setting a plant also in Saudi Arabia on uh, uh, building uh, pre-engineered buildings with aluminum formwork technologies. A total paradigm shift in the industry. So when you're talking about what is going on in the GC countries, a lot. Is the answer to your question, yes, it is easy. Three yes, triple yes, four <laughs> yeses. <laughs> no, the, and the... every area you touch, you'll find really a, a, a potential, of, uh, I would say, list of opportunities that you can tap, tap on. And that's really the challenge for us as a private sector uh, to make sure that we are in perfect alignment with the vision. We are in perfect alignment with the future of the, of the uh, country and the cities uh, from industrial, uh, smart industrial city point of view and also from sustainability point of view. That's another big project, another big topic. Uh, I don't think we will have enough time to do it, but, oh. but in simple, yes, and I just mentioned a few examples that we are doing personally, and again, we are just one of many. I'm sure there are so many private developers there doing a lot of other initiatives in, that, uh, in, in the industry, in the building, and in the recycling. Sure. And that's also exactly the point of view of the architects, because the question I was asking was, is the future of cities being invented lately in the, in the Gulf region, and that's why we look at it very thoroughly. We are very interested because it sets a lot, a lot of questions that we have to, to face now. And uh, carrying on uh, what Montessor said, <clears throat> example, I think so, uh, one of the uh, best examples we can give uh, is the UAE. Hello, can you hear me? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, is the UAE, is the Expo 2020. Um, the way we have sh uh, shifted from Expo 2020 to Expo City now, that is one of the prime examples. I think so we can learn from there a lot. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, those who do not know, the year 2023 has been called the year of sustainability in the UAE because we are going to host COP28. So going on the same topic. So I believe the way they have transformed the entire Expo City and how in the real estate sector make it livable, workable, and uh, enjoyable as well for every, di di every dimension, um, uh, keeping in mind the sustainability element only. I believe there's a lot to learn. As I said, the topic is so broad, but yes, explicity is the example. Thank you very much. I think you give us a lot of hope, and uh, I enjoyed personally very much this uh, roundtable. I hope uh, the public too. So. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, you can meet whoever, whenever. <laughs>